The last presentation is by Dr. Vivian Hoffman. She works for International Food Policy Research Institute, uh, USA, and uh, research addresses uh, how markets and institutions in developing countries affect poverty and health outcomes. Uh, the presentation she is going to make today is uh, Market Incentives for Food Safety and the Adoption of Post-Harvest Technologies. Dr. Hoffman, please. Okay, thank you. I realize we're over time, so I'll try to go quickly through this presentation. Yeah. Um, today I'm presenting work from a randomized control trial with colleagues at IFPRI um, on how we can get farmers to adopt the practices we would like to see them using post-harvest, specifically for the prevention of aflatoxin, which you've heard about through several of the earlier presentations. Uh, this work is funded uh, largely by the Finnish government. We appreciate their support through the Food Africa program and also with co-financing from the CGIAR program on agriculture for nutrition and health. Um, so as you heard earlier, aflatoxin is produced by a fungus, uh, various aspergillus species, and can affect crops starting from pre-harvest and also during the post-harvest period. Um, Ranajit talked about a very effective intervention that can be applied pre-harvest. Um, Water and nutrient control are also important interventions at that stage. I will be talk talking today about interventions at the post-harvest stage. Um, and then once contaminated food gets to the market, we also need to think about how, what happens to that contaminated grain. I won't be addressing that in this, in this presentation, but if you're interested, I'd be happy to talk with you, especially if you have money to fund it, um, because there is a lot of the grain already contaminated in the market. So we've heard about the effects of aflatoxin. Some of the best documented are the acute effects, and this is well known in Kenya. People get sick, people can die. Um, they develop jaundice. In the longer run, over time, people typically develop liver cancer at much higher rates in aflatoxin-affected areas. And there's increasingly strong evidence of aflatoxin's immunosuppressive effects and impacts on child stunting. Um, as you can see, it does terrible things to chickens, and I wouldn't recommend feeding it to your children. So in Kenya, the awareness of aflatoxin is perhaps higher than in most other developing countries. This is just a sampling of some of the headlines from Ken Kenya's Daily, um, Daily Nation, the leading national newspaper, um, of dozens that I found with a keyword search for aflatoxin. So just in the past few years, uh, one study found that 65% of maize milled by Kenyan millers was unfit for consumption according to the Kenyan legal limit of 10 parts per billion. Um, another study showed that the cancer rates in Meru, which is one of the most aflatoxin-affected areas, are surging. And another study war warned about raw milk's contamination. So aflatoxin-contaminated feed is often given to livestock, which then contaminates um, the milk that they produce in turn. All right, so our study site is in eastern part of Kenya. Uh, for those of you not familiar with Kenya, Nairobi is somewhere down here. And we did the study in 30 villages, 30 maize producing villages. We randomized at the village level. So the blue dots are the treatment villages and the red dots are our control areas. So this was across Meru and Tharaka Nithi counties. Um, one of the very effective interventions post-harvest is to dry your maize on some kind of sheet that keeps it off the ground because as you heard, the fungus that produces aflatoxin is endemic in the soil. So we wanna prevent contact with the soil. Another effective intervention when you can't get your maize dry enough through the traditional methods of sun drying is to dry it um, with, with a, for example, this dryer, which uses, um, uses maize cobs as fuel and a diesel-powered engine to drive a fan and pass warm air through, through the maize grain. So our study design was, first of all, to do a baseline survey of just under 700 households across the 30 villages. We then randomized the villages, um, 15 treatment, 15 control. And within the treatment villages, we split the sample into 175 farmers who got an incentive for producing um, aflatoxin safe food as measured three months after harvest. And 175 of them did not receive that incentive. We then invited all of our treatment group farmers to a meeting held prior to the harvest of this year. 
Um, and we actually held two meetings per village. So half of the farmers in each village were getting the, the food safety premium price incentive, and half of them weren't. We didn't want to talk about the premium in front of the ones who weren't, so we, we had separate meetings for those two groups. At the meetings, everybody who was producing at least 45 kg of maize that year was invited to draw a voucher um, through a random lottery. So 50 approximately 50% were able to use the maize dryer for free. 25% got a 150 shilling per bag price, which is about $1.50 per bag. Um, and then 25% were given um, access to the dryer at 350 shillings a bag. And these prices were determined based on what we thought would be sort of the reasonable low and high ball estimate for what this service might cost in the actual market. It's not available yet, so we were, we were kind of guessing here, but we got a wide enough range to see what the demand would be at those two um, sort of extreme prices. I should say also that as part of the inducement to come to the meeting and also to prevent contamination through, um, through the soil immediately during you know, the pre, so people need to dry their maize a little bit before they come and use the dryer because first they need to shell their maize, take their maize off the cobs. And shelling is best done once the maize the moisture level has gone down a little bit. So we gave them plastic sheets to all of the farmers in the treatment group at the meeting. Um, then, just before har or just after harvest, we were in touch with farmers pretty constantly, and we helped get them and their maize to the dryer. The dryers are mobile, um, <coughs> but they're not that mobile. I hear they've become more mobile. Sophie tells Sophie Walker from ACDI Boca, who helped hook us up with these dryers, tells me they can now be transported by motorcycle, which is great. We were using a pickup truck, so we didn't go to Farm Gate, but we went to a central location in each of the villages, and then we brought the farmers and their maize to that central location. And then finally, a couple of months after harvest, or three months after harvest on average, we went back and do a, did a follow-up survey of all of the farmers, and we took samples of grain for those, from those who still had maize in storage, which was about half, of, a little over half of them. Okay, so just to give you a picture of the, of the sample, 52% um, of the farmers that had a ha heads of household had completed primary school and about 15% secondary school. Um, these are smallholder farmers. Most of them have between one and three acres of total land area, and 30% of them have less than that, 5%, 6% have more than that. Um, the average maize harvest in terms of the mean is 475 kilograms, but the median is significantly below that at just 270. So they are very small scale guys, and in contrast to the farmers that Ranajit was talking about earlier who are part of an integrated value chain of feed production, these farmers are producing mostly for household subsistence and also selling some maize to the market, but they're not part of a chain that's easy to manipulate by you know, offering automatically higher prices for the, um, the uncontaminated feed. So we have to think of, it's, it's a little bit of a harder market to intervene in in terms of incentivizing the, the take up of these aflatoxin reducing technologies. Um, like I said, awareness of aflatoxin in Kenya is actually quite high. So 67.5% of farmers said that they had heard of some kind of sickness caused by eating bad maize. Um, they weren't necessarily able to name aflatoxin, but when we mentioned aflatoxin, 65% of them said that they had heard of aflatoxin. Um, and all of those farmers, I should say, were able to describe aflatoxin as either related to mold or, um, or being poisonous. So that they had some idea of what it meant. Um, <clears throat> moreover, they were pretty well aware of the, the intervention, the recommended practices for mitigating aflatoxin contamination. So 85% said that they knew they should dry their maize fully before storage. 43% said they should store it off the ground rather than directly on the ground in a bag. Um, and 25% said that they should dry their maize off the bare ground. Um, now, of those households, almost everybody um, dried their maize to some extent. The rest, I suppose, ate it green or, or sold it right away. Um, and the mean number of days spent drying was 8.5. So when we're talking about drying here, we're talking about putting the maize, laying the maize out either directly on the ground or perhaps on some kind of mat and just waiting for the sun to do its work. Um, this can take a while and often um, during the post-harvest period in this area, there is rainfall and so when that happens, people can either bag their maize up and bring it inside, which is pretty labor intensive and you have to do it quickly to get, you know, to get it out before the rain. Um, but 33% of people simply just leave it there uh, and allow that, rain, that um, maize to get wet again, which has got to be terrible for you know, incubating aflatoxigenic um, aspergillus. Most people, or almost half of people, dried their maize directly on the bare ground. Um, 
40, 40 or so odd percent used some kind of a drying platform or drying mat, and then some people just left it on the maize stalks to dry. Okay, so going back to our, our study design and looking at the actual compliance at each of these stages, um, we had really good attendance at our meetings. 93% of farmers overall came to the meetings they were invited to. Um, and then somewhat lower compliance at the stage of setting prices because a lot of farmers did not harvest much maize. And so we said, you know, to use the dryer, you need at least 45 kilograms, so you're not gonna draw a price if you produce less than that. But we still had about 72% of farmers who were producing enough to use the dryer, and so they drew a price. And these are our price income, so incentive versus no incentive. Um, you have the numbers who, who faced each of these prices there. Okay, and then at Endline, we were able to track down 611 of the farmers on the day we went to their villages, um, of which we were able to take 328 maize samples. Okay, so just to review the prices and incentives, um, so the cost of, or the price of maize varies a lot over the season. Um, on average, the, the year before, or the, at the, from the baseline data, around this time of year, the cost of maize was about 30 shillings or 30 cents per kilogram or 3,000 shillings for a 90 kg bag. Um, the price at which we were offering drying services for the low price was equal to about 5% of that cost at the bag level um, and 12% for the higher price. So the price is pretty high relative to the, the cost of, of maize itself. Um, and the premium that we offered, now we had to compromise here a little bit with research design to be feasible. We couldn't feasibly buy up all the maize that farmers were potentially ready to sell us. So what we did what we, was we offered a really high premium just for the first 45 kg. Um, so we offered 50% you know, of the expected market price, but only for a half a bag. And we, that, that should translate into approximately what the return they would get on a 15% increase for a more, which, is, which has been seen in the market, for a more realistic volume of sale. Okay, so what did we see in terms of take up? Um, what I've plotted out here is the proportion of farmers who brought their maize to the dryer and handed over the money, if they were charged a price, um, to have their maize dried. And as you can see, take up is quite high in the free treatment, so <clears throat> there's no statistically significant difference between the two treatments at the, at the free price point, as you would expect. Um, and that was 70% uh, or about 70% of farmers brought their maize. Um, now, demand for the dryer drops off pretty quickly in the group which was not offered a price incentive for the, the aflatoxin safe maize and continues to drop down to only 17% willing to pay 350 shillings per bag. However, among those in the, in the price incentive treatment, demand stayed pretty constant up to 150 shillings and then dropped down somewhat but was still significantly higher um, at least I should say, okay, because my numbers for that, um, for that group are quite small, the error bars are huge, but when I pool the two price treatments, we do have a strongly significantly different demand um, between the two treatment groups. Okay. Now, when the maize showed up at the dryer, it turned out that it had been a fantastic year for sun drying. So um, the red line indicates 13.5% moisture content, and anything above that, we dried. Anything below that, we told the farmers it was fine, they could go ahead and store it, and we refunded their money. Um, because we're not going to really improve matters by drying it down to 11%. So, um, so, so in this particular year, um, it turns out that the dryer was not as useful as it would be in other years. And I've seen data from this region where farmers are not able to get their maize any drier than 16% on average. So, um, so I think some of my findings are going to be year specific and point to sort of some, some interesting heterogeneity across years in the effectiveness of different technologies that we'll need to think about um, when we're trying to market these to farmers. Because sometimes these technologies are really important and sometimes some of them aren't as important depending on weather conditions. Um, okay, the average amount of maize that farmers brought was 120 kilograms. That's the mean, the median was a bit lower, around 80. Um, and it was about 54% of the harvested amount for those farmers. So they're drying a significant amount of the maize um, in this first year that they've been offered the service, which I think is encouraging. All right, so what was the impact on aflatoxin? Well, first of all, just comparing our treatment and control group broadly, um, not worrying about which technologies they actually used. So remember the treatment group, oh, I've got those reversed, sorry. So <laughs> control has more aflatoxin and treatment has less. And so the treatment, which was giving out the plastic sheets for drying and also offering access to the dryer, reduced the aflatoxin contamination level, the mean, by about a third. 
Um, when we look at the tarps only versus the people who bought the tarps only versus those who use the dryer, um, the impact of the dryer is only about 10% additional reduction. And that's not statistically significantly different, but like I said, very few people actually ended up drying their maize because the moisture content was already quite low. Um, one last thought that I want to leave you with. We do not obviously have much of a sample size here. Um, these are just the people who had both um, some maize stored for consumption and maize also stored for sale. When we compare the aflatoxin levels in those two different purposes of maize, um, well, I should say the reason we're doing this is because I was afraid going into the study that providing incentives for the market could improve the quality offered to the market at the cost of the quality consumed on farm. And so I wanted to make sure that we weren't compromising farmers' own health in order to supply the market with healthier food. And indeed, we don't see that effect, which is great news. Um, so in the consumption sample for those who were not given the incentive, the average PPB in the small sample was 13.9. Um, in the food safety incentive, it didn't change. It went up to 4.2, but obviously that's not statistically significant at all. It's practically the same number. Um, in the sale sample, that's where we saw a big reduction for the food safety incentive. So it looks like, if anything, if any of this means anything, because it's only 10 people, um, it looks like those you know, who don't have an incentive might be selling the worst stuff. Um, but that disappears when we offer the incentive, which, which was the point. So in some, um, Kenyan farmers are willing to pay. 40% of them are willing to pay something to dry their maize, even without an incentive. But that goes up to around 60% when they get an incentive to sell um, quality, quality food. And um, the impact of particular technologies, again, will vary from year to year. And the fourth one I didn't put up is that we probably don't need to worry too much about adverse impacts on own consumption. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman. I think we have finished with all the presentations.